My name is Howard Kakita. I'm a sensei born in Los Angeles. My story is about how a seven and a half year old boy and his older brother got stranded in Hiroshima, separated from our parents when the A-bomb was dropped and we were approximately 1.3 kilometers from the hypocenter. Our parents at that time were incarcerated in Poston, Arizona for the duration of the war. This is a story of our survival from the devastation and the physical and emotional trauma that we had suffered and adjusting to the new life in America. Both of my parents are Niseis. They're second generation Americans. And uh, they, my father was born in Bakersfield, California. And uh, my mother was in uh, Brawley, California. Both of my parents uh, went back to Japan at a very early age. Uh, my father, at pretty young age, uh, probably in, in the early teens, came back to the United States alone and worked as a houseboy in Bakersfield. Okay, he grew up there, went to high school, uh, started to work, uh, and he was living a pretty happy life until around age 25, uh, he had a girlfriend, and I guess things were getting pretty serious there, until uh, he received a letter from his father, which is my grandfather, saying that uh, you are now married, your wife is arriving in San Pedro Harbor, go pick her up. So he said it was very difficult uh, for him to tell his girlfriend that uh, now he is now married and that <laughs> he has to go pick up his wife in San Pedro. Uh, you know, they had a wonderful life. Well, I don't know, maybe not such a wonderful life, but uh, they were married for 50 some odd years until they passed away. They were married in 1935. Uh, my older brother, Kenny, was born in 1936, uh, and I was born in 1938. Well, my father received words uh, through letter that uh, his father was gravely ill and that he was not expected to live uh, much longer and that he desperately wanted to see uh, his uh, children as well as the only grandkids uh, they had, that was my brother and myself. So my father packed us all up uh, in early, very early in 1940, probably around January. Uh, so my brother Kenny, myself, my father, and my mother, who at that time was eight months pregnant. You know, you have a photo of us on the ship, and although she was hiding her bump in her tummy, uh, she was definitely pregnant, and she was determined not to have the baby until she arrived in Japan and reached her destination uh, where she was born, in Pulue. So on February 20th uh, of 1940, my younger brother, Albert Kenji, uh, was born. So that's tickets in February, and then we stayed in Japan until June of that year. Uh, there were parties and lots of reunion. And miraculously, my father, his health, my grandfather, I meant, his uh, health uh, greatly improved during this period. Until he found out that uh, we were all returning to the United States. That was in June. And, you know, by that time, the money has run out. Uh, my parents still had home in Los Angeles, uh, which they had to take care of. But when my grandfather's health started declining, uh, they decided to take care of their business in the United States and then return to Japan to take care of uh, my grandfather. Well, to show good faith that they were planning to return, they left my older brother Kenny and myself in their care. That was June of 1940. However, uh, the war started, and my parents uh, and the whole family uh, were interned in Poston, Arizona, along with all the other Japanese American in the neighborhood. Okay. And they were there for the duration of the war. It was uh, Monday morning, a bright sunny day, probably a beautiful day as I recall. Uh, and we got uh, ready for school. In Japan, uh, there was no summer vacation uh, those days. 
we, dug, we had school in August. So my brother Kenny and I, uh, we dug, got dressed and started towards school when we saw uh, quite a number of uh, kids coming back from school towards us. And they told us that there had been enemy aircraft warning in the neighborhood. So the school was canceled that day. So ha happily, we ran home, changed into our clo uh, play clothes. And just about time, that time was about 8 o'clock in the morning or maybe thereafter. And then this air raid siren sounded again. So my Kenny and I, we climbed up onto the roof of our house, uh, watching the vapor trail in the distance coming over. The B-29 always had a nice, beautiful vapor trail. When that, during that time, my grandmother was, uh, came out of the kitchen extremely mad, and she told us to get off the roof. So we grudgingly, came off the roof, and then my brother Kenny uh, went towards the front, uh, was the side gate, like a moan, and we went uh, through there. My grandmother, uh, seeing that we came off the roof, went back to the kitchen, and presumably she, to wash the continue doing the dishes. I myself went into a separate uh, structure, which uh, we had uh, next to the kitchen that housed the bathhouse. And uh, we went, I went underneath that structure uh, when the bomb uh, exploded. Now, in the outskirts of Japan, uh, people will say that uh, there was a huge flash. And then several seconds later, there would be a huge boom and cloud of dust coming towards them at tremendous speed. When the bomb went off, I was only 1.3 kilometer from ground zero, or 4,400 feet, which is relatively close. So the flash and the boom was probably uh, less than a second apart. So I, I don't remember anything. I didn't hear the, I didn't see the flash. I didn't hear the boom. All I know was, and I'm not sure how long after the bomb exploded, that uh, I came to. When I came to, I was under a considerable amount of debris. Uh, everything has fallen down on top of me. Uh, however, I was not injured, other than being uh, un unconscious for a number of minutes. So I dug myself out. Uh, things were beginning to smoke and uh, fire were beginning to uh, burn around me. But I was able to get out, and then I went up towards the courtyard. And by that time, Kenny, uh, coming back, came back into the courtyard from being outside the gate. And he had a, a small burn, radiation burn, circular burn on his forehead. So evidently, somehow the ray struck him, small ray struck him in the head. Uh, but he was not you know, severely injured. However, my grandmother was uh, facing a window uh, when the explosion occurred. And all of the broken glasses uh, were thrown into her body, and she had dozens of small glasses embedded in her body. But she was uh, functional. She was able to get up. Uh, and uh, my grandfather, I guess, uh, he was well enough to you know, dig her out. She, he, and a couple of other men. By that time, things are beginning to burn all around us. Uh, every structure that we could see within that little neighborhood uh, was, were burning. Okay, so my grandfather said, well, he, he and some of the men are go going to try to put out the fire, not realizing the extent of the damage. The whole city was on fire, and there was probably no use in doing whatever they were doing. But he told my grandmother to take the kids, us, uh, and go towards the mountain, which wasn't burning, okay, away from the city. So, now, I always tell the people that I think I had three traumatic events in my life, you know. And certainly, uh, this, this is, was one of them, the, the first one. When we got to the road, they were... I don't know, uh, 50, 100, lots of people, many people, severely injured, with uh, injuries that you could not believe, broken limbs, 
Okay, there are people with such a terrible burn that the skin will be dripping from their body. Okay, there'll be some people, well, this one person I saw had guts hanging out from their tummy, you know, holding on. And some of them have already fallen on the ground begging for water. You know, there's, uh, they say that usually just before you die, you get extremely thirsty. So people say, don't give them water because they will die. But they will have died anyway. And by that time, the streets were already lined with <clears throat> corpses. So we went through the sea of carnage. And finally, uh, I don't know how long it took. Uh, it may have been, uh, you know, 30 minutes. It may have been an hour. It may have been hours. Um, but uh, I don't know how long it took, but we finally got away from the city that was burning and away from many of the people uh, with such severe injuries. And we got to a train station that was functional. I remember riding on the train and going to a relative uh, who lived in an area called Kabe. Um, there were distant relatives there. And we stayed there until the end of the war. Perhaps at this point, I should mention the, my maternal side. They lived in Fulue, which is, uh, I think is approximately three miles uh, from Ground Zero. And they were basically farmers. Uh, they, you know, they were farming at that time. And uh, at, on that particular day, uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, grandfather, grandmother, and also my youngest uncle in that family, the three of them uh, took their uh, produce and went into the city to sell. Although I don't know exact location when the bomb exploded, but they must have been extremely close. Uh, my grandmother's body was never recovered. She just disappeared. Uh, my grandfather uh, was severely injured and somehow made it back to uh, Furue. Uh, only to die a few days later. My uncle, uh, he said that he was thrown into the river, uh, which probably saved his life, but he was severely bo burned on both of his legs. Well, I mentioned that the first traumatic moment was the bomb itself. The second traumatic moment was when we returned to, Hirosh uh, to Yokogawa. I mean, you could not believe the whole community uh, much as the whole city was gone. It was flat. The, uh, the area is relatively flat area, so you could see across uh, quite a number of blocks. Only thing that remained were uh, non-combustible items, such as concrete, sheet metal, rocks, uh, no vegetation. Uh, only thing that's maybe organic uh, that still laid around were char, gruesome bodies. Um, there was some quite an effort being taken, you know, way before we returned, where uh, people gathered the bodies and uh, uh, they cremated them uh, as soon as quickly as possible. So the, the stench of cremation, the burnt body, is something that you can't forget. Um, I had a dysentery. Uh, I lost uh, some of my hair. Okay, and you can see, I think you have a picture of uh, when we look a little bit bald. <laughs> yeah, so I lost uh, some of my hair, but um, but we recovered from that uh, pretty well. Kenny has same ailment. He had dysentery, loss of hair, uh, but we both reco uh, recovered. I'm not sure of the exact date. But sometime in early 1946, here's a picture of my classmates and me taken adjacent to what was once the auditorium at the Misasa Elementary School just north of Yokogawa. Unfortunately, it was missing uh, all those that had died or were severely injured. I'm on the top row, third from the right. My parents were in Poston, Arizona, as I mentioned. And uh, when the A-bomb was dropped, uh, evidently they got hold of a newspaper which had an aerial view of the totality of Hiroshima area. 
And within that area of view, there were rings of destruction, like the center painted in red would be the area of total destruction. And then maybe quarter miles later, it'll be 75%. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of making up the percentage, but, uh, and then it kind of expands out. But uh, the problem was that we were in this, the first ring of total destruction, and they could pinpoint where we were exactly because it's a junction of two major rivers, and they say, well, that's where we were living. So they had little hope that we had survived. However, um, they did initiate a search uh, through various organizations to, uh, to find us. And it was through the American Red Cross. Several months later, it wasn't immediate. It, they told us that it took them quite a bit of time now, I never found out exactly what quite a bit of time is, but I would think it's measuring months uh, before they found out that uh, uh, we have survived. Around January of 1948, uh, they told us that uh, we had to return to the United States uh, to go back to our parents, whom we don't remember and leave our grandmother who raised us uh, and, and saved us. Basically, we raised holy hell. I mean, we didn't want to go back, come back to the United States. We wanted to stay with grandma. Okay, that was our mentality. However, with the, lots of yelling, crying, and so forth, uh, they put us on a ship uh, from Yokohama in March of 1948, uh, destined uh, for United States. It took us two, two weeks uh, with a stopover in uh, Hawaii to finally get here. So two of us, uh, my brother at the 11 and a half and myself at 10, uh, we were on the ship all by ourselves. We arrived in um, San, uh, San Francisco. And as we got off the ship, uh, you know, our parents, uh, you know, found us. Uh, and it was, I mean, for them, it was a very emotional thing. For us, it was kind of awkward, you know. There's, there's two, two people there trying to hug us and uh, so forth, uh, you know. But they were saying, gee, who are these people? It's, it's kind of a strange feeling. Then ultimately, uh, we arrived in Los Angeles, and we stayed in an uh, area called Bunker Hills. Uh, the language being the biggest, biggest barrier. Uh, American English language is not something easy to, is, uh, that's easy to comprehend by Japanese. In Japanese, everything is monosyllable, and, and English language have all these pronunciation and exceptions and so forth uh, that'll drive you crazy. Grade-wise, you know, I would get two A's. Uh, one with mathematics, naturally, and, and physical education then everything else will be F's, f failure, or D. By the time I got to the eighth grade, I was beginning to uh, get the hang of the English language. Um, and I was uh, more or less functional in a classroom. Really credit my parents, you know, for their understanding uh, and their tremendous effort to make a transition into American life as uh, smoothly as possible. I knew I was an American when, <laughs> I guess I was in 10th grade. My uncle, who lives in Japan, uh, he, he's my father's younger brother. He's number three. Um, and he was uh, given away a, as an adopted boy to another family, okay, because they, they had no heirs in that particular family. And they had, uh, so, my uncle came to my our house in the United States at that time, and he has no heirs. You know, they, they're not able to have any children. So he asked me to be adopt, adopted by him uh, to take over his business, uh, you know, when I grow up. And he has a very successful business in Hiroshima. And I told him, no, there's no way I could do that. I got football practice, you know, next week. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess that that's a point that you realize, hey, I'm a, I'm a Yankee, you know, I'm an American. After I came back from Japan, 
This is back in 1948. Uh, my mother would tell me that I used to wake up in the middle of the night screaming, you know, the nightmares. And I had difficulty with some of the food items, anything that had a tinge of red, like spaghetti with marinara sauce, uh, uh, or pink uh, grapefruit. I had trouble with that. Um, rare meat. Uh, anything that remind me of the carnage that I witnessed as a child. So I had trouble eating and swallowing, you know, those items. Uh, but, but as time went by, by 1955, uh, 10 years after the A-bomb seemed to have dissipated. Uh, since then, I've been able to talk about it. Although some subject I get into sometimes gets me a little bit choked up. Okay, but I could discuss this thing perhaps uh, with less emotion than some of my people in the audience. Okay, because I've done it so often that maybe I've become hardened to it. Uh, when we decided to get married, uh, back in 1962. I told my wife, you know, that, you know, I have, I have a background, the, the radiation. Uh, I had radiation po uh, sickness. Uh, uh, that basically I told her I may not live that long. Then we discussed, you know, is there any possibility of uh, our offspring uh, having some problem? And, uh, you, you know, I talked about uh, Three trauma, the three traumas I had, the A-bomb, uh, coming back to Hokugawa. The third one was when we came back to the United States. That was a traumatic you know, event. Well, fourth one is that happened after we got married. And um, we, you know, we, have, we, had, we had three children, okay, two girls and one boy. The oldest one uh, being the boy. Well, at age of five, he got cancer and died. So, you know, now, is that, was that because of the radiation or was something else? So I always, you know, inquired to the doctor and said, gee, you know, what do you, what do you think? He said, no, it's, uh, they said, no, there's no correlation between that and, and the death of your son. So, uh, but, you know, who knows? And for the war, uh, what made it led to the decision of the bomb and so forth. And, you know, my interest uh, is in studying some of the reason for the war. And I, I still get, I have tremendous anger towards the, the government or the leaders that will allow something like this to happen. Japan is uh, the military uh, leadership there drove the war. I think the military decision, the government decision, uh, was really complicit in, in, in this happening. Now, the United States uh, is another area. Do I people blame the people of the United States for doing this? No. Who do I blame? You know, who do I believe was the cause of uh, such event to take place? So the leadership of the world are the one that drove this devastation. And I blame them uh, for the catastrophe. Uh, in my younger days, I used to think that there's no one in the world be dumb enough to drop another bomb like this again. But looking at the climate, world climate of uh, situation today, uh, things are getting worse. The U.S. have 1,600 atomic weapons. Russia has similar amount. And then all the other countries are put together or maybe have the same amount as the United States. I mean, that's more than enough to destroy the world several times over. Okay. And some of these uh, weapons, atomic nuclear weapons, are several orders of magnitude more powerful than the A-bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. And I think uh, we're less safe than we have been in the past. I'm sharing my story with you, as many other Hibakusha have done before me, to describe the terror, misery, and devastation and death 
caused by a single primitive bomb. It's our hope that by sharing our stories, it will mitigate the proliferation of nuclear weapons and ultimately ban their use altogether.